Hi, Venture. My name is Gabe Short from Shepherd Community Center here on the near east side of Indianapolis. We are so excited to host a group uh, on Sunday, September 29th for Venture Out. Um, the group that I'll be leading down here at Shepherd will be cleaning up some of the streets and alleys surrounding the main community center building here on the east side. Um, this is important for visibility out in the neighborhood as well as showing our neighbors that we care as much um, about keeping the neighborhood clean as we do caring for its people. So looking forward to having you serve with us. have signed up to be a part of Venture Out. Awesome. Uh, it's it's going to be incredible. By the way, these partner organizations, these people, even individuals, they're counting on us. So if you've signed up, please show up. If you have not yet signed up, I don't know what you're waiting for. Come on, jump on the bus. Here we go. It's going to be awesome. Speaking of things like buses, I had a bizarre driver's education experience. Now, I know every anxious teenager feels like they could say that. Let me tell you about mine. In Illinois, where I grew up, driver's education was, at least at that point, still in the school system, and so I had a semester of driver's education. Half of the semester was in a classroom. Half of the semester was behind the wheel with an instructor. Now, I had it on pretty good authority that my driver's ed behind the wheel instructor had had enough DUIs that they had revoked a license. He was not legal to drive himself to and from school, but this is the guy that taught me how to drive. <laughs> I already knew how to drive. I grew up on a farm. We had been driving farm trucks since I was little. Actually, my behind-the-wheel hours, I know we still do this in Indiana. The kids have to get X number of hours behind the wheel before they get their license. These were mine. I told you last week about my chaos in my adolescence. Mom was dying of cancer. One of her last wishes was for our family to go on a vacation together to, you guessed it, Disney. So... I had to have like 20 hours behind the wheel. We had a 1978 champion motorhome. It was not a champion. <laughs> my dad tossed me the keys in our driveway in Lincoln, Illinois. My behind the wheel hours where I, dad went to the back to take care of mom and I drove to Florida and then I think I drove most of the way home as well. That's how I got my hours. But here's how this worked out practically. And this is the story I want to zero in on this morning. Behind the wheel, here I am. In the back seat, there's three pimply-faced teenagers in the car and a driver's instructor. He's got the brake. You know how this works from the passenger seat. Two dudes in the back. We had each taken a turn driving that day. Now it's her turn. She's in the front seat. I don't know if she rolled through the intersection. I don't know if she didn't look both ways. But here we are in the middle of a four-way stop. Driver's and instructor slams on the brakes and starts shouting at her. You have to mind the intersections, he yells. Be careful in the intersections because good things and bad things can happen in the intersections. I've thought about that a few times in my life, not just when I'm rolling up to a four-way stop or a roundabout in these parts. It's kind of a metaphor for life if you stop and think about it. I want to talk to you today about intersections because we have the opportunity for good things or bad things to happen in those intersections that life presents to us. Welcome to week two of our series, Life on Loan. We're talking about this idea as we gear up to go out and serve our community well, that service is an opportunity, that our lives are literally on loan from God. What's the verse we looked at last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 6? You are not your own. Your life, you were bought at a price. And last week we talked about this. The price is Jesus. The price is very dearly. Your life was very dearly purchased. 
King Jesus sacrificed his life so that you might live. Your life is literally on loan from God. Do your decisions, do your reinvestments back into others' lives? Do your daily decisions reflect that your life is on loan from God? Listen, as you travel this journey of life, as you live your life on loan from God, today I want to talk about those very specific moments those intersections that life presents to you. So, with your hands firmly on the wheel at 10 and 2, could we talk about, could I give you a couple of challenges on how to approach this life on loan and pay attention in the intersections because good things and bad things can happen in the intersections. Here's the first one. Open your eyes. I think this happens sometimes, early driver's education. We get so freaked out, maybe it's because the instructor in the seat next to us is yelling at us, we just close our eyes and seize up. Open your eyes, what do you see? Better question, what or who, who are you looking for? Here's some ideas under this concept of opening your eyes as you drive through the intersections. Look for what matters. Look for what matters. Consumer culture tells us that along with our preoccupation for more stuff, we need more activity, more things to do, more places to go, more destinations to hit, more people to impress. We're obsessed with greater achievements and better products, which maybe take the shape of fun or money or toys or hobbies or relationships or jobs, accomplishments. The list is nearly endless. Most of us keep trying to shove things into the vacuum of our lives with the expectation that then, then we'll be at peace and then, then we'll be happy. I like this quote from a speech writer to both former President Reagan and Bush. This quote is from the 80s. By the way, I just saw the Reagan movie. I dug it. I recommend that to you. We are, she said, Peggy Noonan, we are the first generations of man that actually expected to find happiness here on earth. That's an interesting sentence in and of itself. The first generation, she said this in the 80s, we're the first ones that actually thought we would get happiness here on earth. That's an interesting thought. And our search for it has caused such unhappiness. We chase after more and more and we discover, oh, that leaves me empty and not even happy. Look, look for what matters. What are you looking for? Are you looking for things that actually matter? We're so preoccupied with more that we often lose sight of most. We sacrifice most for more. In the search for more, better, greater, we forget to look at what God says is the most, the best, the greatest, the most beneficial thing that we can do in this life is to find God and to love him. He said it very clearly, the great commandment. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He's quoting the Shema in the Old Testament. He says this is the first and greatest commandment. Then the second best thing Jesus follows up immediately following that with is this the idea that you're called to love one another, even to roll up your sleeves and serve one another. The second is like it. Love your neighbor just like you love yourself. Oh, selfless, getting outside of myself, my desires, my drives, my needs. This is why we want to shine a spotlight on this opportunity in two weeks' time. You just heard Kyle talking about it. September 29th, we're going to cancel services the way we typically do them. We're going to meet here. We're going to rally together. Then we're going to go out and serve them. We're going to venture out to be good neighbors. Why? Because in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus sums up what it means to love God and to love other people. Check, check this out. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Serve. And whoever wants to be first 
must be he doubles down on this idea. It takes even a stronger word approach here. Be your slave. Are we serving? Serving is a big deal. He said these words, by the way, to his friends after their mama. Perhaps you remember this moment with James and John, the sons of thunder. Their mama, who also had some lightning and thunder, I'm betting in her personality. She just tried to secure a seat for her sons next to Jesus in his heavenly kingdom. Not only did Jesus say those words to his friend, both of them, to their mama, he showed them what it meant when he rolled up his sleeves and he put on a servant's apron and a towel and he washed their feet. You see, Jesus didn't just tell us how to think and how to act, but he acted on what he said. Here's another idea. See people. Open up your eyes. Look for what matters. And as you do that, actually see people. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up, would you, to Luke chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible with you, that Bible underneath the seat, I'm on page 1035. As you turn there, let me set up the the, the story here. Jesus is invited to have dinner at Simon's home. Not Simon Peter, Simon a different dude. Simon was one of the religious leaders, actually, of his day. And it would be no surprise then that he'd want to connect with Jesus. How to win friends and influence people is probably on his mind. After all, Jesus was getting all kinds of attention from the locals with what he's teaching about God, with the miracles that he performed, with his claims of being the Messiah. Simon says, come over. I want to see what this is all about. So Jesus had Simon over for a meal during the meal. A woman who was locally known, she did not have the best reputation in town. She came into the room. She began to wash Jesus' feet. Her tears and expensive perfume that she had bought served as the water, and then she used her hair as the towel. This is a little weird. And it's a beautiful human moment, this tremendous act of respect and devotion was impressive, especially since this was not this woman's job to be washing somebody's feet. It was the custom of the day to wash the feet of a guest who's traveled through the city to your home, and that act was a normal way to show respect for the guest of honor. Somehow Simon didn't get that memo, and this woman, in humble respect for Jesus, paid him this great tribute. Simon, though, is looking at this spectacle, and he thinks to himself, well, let's, let's read it together, shall we? I'm in verse 39. When the Pharisee, oh, yeah, we did a series not long ago, recovering Pharisees like me. This runs deep. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. We all know about her loose reputation. She's a sinner. If he knew, then he'd know. In other words, Simon thought that Jesus should boot her out on the street or maybe yell at her or embarrass her somehow. Well, Jesus responds to Simon's thoughts. It's kind of a scary thought in and of itself, isn't it? What if Jesus were to respond to what you're thinking right now? Not saying, but thinking. Jesus told Simon a story about people who owed money. One person owed a little bit of money. The other person owed a lot. Here's the point of the story. Both were forgiven of their debts. Then Jesus asked Simon, who do you think should be more grateful? Simon answered, probably the one that owed the most money. Jesus told him, well, you're exactly right. Then this interesting thing happens in the story. Look at verse 44. Then Jesus turned toward the woman, looks at her, and said to Simon, talks to him, bridging these two people in the story. Do you see this woman? This wasn't some kind of an eye test. 
like, can you see the big E on the wall? This wasn't even a challenge to see if Simon would acknowledge the woman's presence. Jesus was asking Simon, what do you see? Do you see this woman or do you only see her faults? Do you see her or the stuff in her life that he didn't like? Did he see the person or was he blinded by her issues? Listen, we're going to go out and serve in a couple of weeks' time. What will you see? I don't know yet who you're going to encounter. I don't know who Jesus has in store for you to roll up your sleeves that day and serve. But i got to be honest with you. Sometimes I really can relate to Simon. I can be like him. You probably can relate as well. Can you look past dysfunction? Can you look past pain? Can you look past even a pattern of sin and a lifestyle of sin? Can you look past that to see a human heart? So here you go, right along with that idea, check your eyesight. Check it. Who are you not seeing today? Who is it inside your sphere of influence Jesus would call you to open up your eyes, check your eyesight, and really see them? Jesus was asking Simon if he could see this woman as a little girl who used to love to love and laugh and play. I was with a group of our staff team last night, and I was watching a bunch of the little kids, staff kids, on our staff team here at church, just watching them playing, and there's something refreshing. Listen, a kid can make a toy out of anything. You know this if you've raised kids. They were playing with a pile of firewood, and just listening to them giggle and laugh and be a kid, uh, my, my mouth was tired from smiling so much watching this. Listen, every hurting, every broken, Every cynical adult that you meet in life used to be somebody's child. When you see an adult in their brokenness, do you ever stop and think about where they've come from? That homeless person that some of you will serve in a couple of weeks. They used to be an innocent child before life and its hurts and its habits and its hang-ups got piled on top of their shoulders. That teenage mom who maybe has a child that some of you are going to serve in a couple of weeks, she used to be somebody else's baby. Innocent. Loving life. Playing. And life has been hard and her shoulders are becoming broader than she thought they could ever be. Simon? Could he see some of the hurts in this gal's life? Could he see a teenager with so much potential, but no one was there to encourage her? Could he see that she was confused and making some poor choices? Could he see a woman whose heart had been chipped away at and now was much harder than she wanted it to be? That's what Jesus saw in the woman who washed his feet with her tears. Here's the question. Would you have seen her? If you do, here you go. Look for opportunities to serve. Don't miss the obvious moments. Sometimes the opportunity to roll up your sleeves and to serve somebody, it's just obvious. Like when your church plans something and serves up a serving opportunity for you on a silver platter. If you haven't signed up yet, what are you waiting for? Come on, join us for Venture Out. Look for opportunities to serve. Open up your eyes. There was a study released years ago. It happened at the University of Illinois. Go fighting Illini. And this group of people were invited to pay close attention to a basketball being passed and forth, back and forth between people with white shirts and black shirts. And the idea was you're supposed to count the number of times somebody wearing a white shirt passes the basketball back and forth. It was an attention test. Actually, they called it an inintentional blindness. And... Uh, as people are watching this, some of you are giggling. Some of you are, what, what are we giggling at? I'm up to, what, seven, eight, nine? I don't know. I've lost track now. How many of you saw it? Yeah? 
only 50% of the original study saw the gorilla that walked from your right screen to left screen. He actually stopped for, I think it was like seven seconds in the middle of it and beat his chest with his fists. And then he walked on off the screen. Listen, we can be so focused on the thing, the task, counting the passes that we never see the gorilla in the room. Are you so focused on whatever task is at hand that you're missing out on what's going on around you? What would happen today, this week, this year, if you were to see the people around you, really see them? To look at the people in your home, not their issues. To look at the people at work, regardless of your connection or network that you happen to be in or not. See the people that you pass on the street, in the store, in the gas station. You might not like some of their choices or their actions, but do you see what God sees in each of these people? When we begin to see people, it can cause you to redefine what faith is. When we love God and we really see by loving our neighbors, it's only another small step to serve them, to put into action our faith. Here's the biblical truth. You will never lock eyes with anybody who isn't valued by God just as you are valued by God, no matter what his or her life looks like. One of Jesus' first disciples, Peter, gave good instructions on how to live wherever we are right now, how to live a life on loan. Look at this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He says, the end of all things is near. We're going through intersections, looking for intersections in life, right? Peter is saying, be alert. Make sure your hands are on 10 and 2. Good things and bad things can happen in the intersections. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. This is what it looks like to live a life on loan. And above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another. Do you view your stuff like even your home or that boat or whatever it is that you have that God has blessed you with? That's actually a command to offer hospitality, to serve one another in that way. Let's keep reading. Without grumbling, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Huh. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Grace comes through several different kinds of vehicles. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. What, what's that old phrase? Speak the gospel always. If you have to, use words. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ because to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. I told you I had a couple of observations. The first one is open your eyes. Do you really see people? Do you see the opportunity, those intersections that life provides? If you do, here's the other observation. Actively bring grace, God's grace, to those intersections. Actively be looking for grace in the intersections. And let's go ahead and define those intersections. Let's just grab a couple of ideas if we can. Let's talk about these intersections because your neighbor has intersections, moments in life where they're open to something. Your coworker, your one. You have one life to invest. Who's the one life you are investing in? Their lives are filled with intersections. Let's just call a few of them out, shall we? How about change? Oh, anytime we experience change, things are a little bit upside down in our life. This is an intersection. It's an opportunity. You and I need to pay attention to those intersections. When a new neighbor moves into your neighborhood, this is an opportunity to bring grace to the intersection. How about pain? I love that C.S. Lewis quote. 
pain is God's megaphone shouting to a deaf world. When somebody in your life goes through the death of a loved one, this is an opportunity for you to run to that intersection and bring God's grace to that moment. How about just good old-fashioned need? Do you rub shoulders with folks who are from a different socioeconomic class than you are? Do you know people in your life that are struggling with need right now? Or it might be as simple as your neighbor across the street has a need for a particular tool to accomplish a project in their house. There's an opportunity here. This is a need. You could run with grace toward that intersection. Roll up your sleeves. Invest. We talked last week about leveraging your story as a way to live your life on loan. Listen, ultimately, God is interested in connecting each person with his story. If you've discovered God's story in a personal way, it's more than likely that an introduction for you came through another person. Maybe it's a friend, a neighbor, a teacher, a mentor, or a family member probably helped you discover God's story. One person to another person, this has been the delivery method since the very beginning. Jesus' challenge to his closest associates was to, we know it as the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Great Commission. If you are a believer and a follower of God, then God's invitation to you is to become a preacher. Wait, what? I didn't sign up for that. Now, before you have a heart attack, a preacher is simply one who proclaims. Well, most of us are seen reaching as something only a pastor does. The Bible says that we're all ministers. So run. Run to the intersection. Bring grace. I love this quote by Steve Shogren, a pastor. He says, it seems people don't necessarily remember what they are told of God's love, but they never forget what they have experienced of God's love. As you live your life on loan, you get to choose the best way to communicate God's story. The message is the same. It's love, it's grace, redemption through Jesus. This doesn't change, but the methods can change. As you live your life on loan for God, serving him, honoring him, you're going to rub shoulders with people who do not necessarily believe yet. As a preacher, you take your experiences, your personality, and your changed story, and you find ways to intersect others' lives and to connect them to God's story. You're helping people change the ending to their story. And here's an opportunity. Serving can clear a blocked intersection. I've lived in Hamilton County now for like 18 years. I've come to see the value of roundabouts. I just spent some time in England a few weeks ago. I thought we had a lot of roundabouts here. They have a lot there. I drove like 600 miles across England, and oh my goodness, roundabouts I think have a value. Listen, intersections, serving can clear it. Good deeds. Service done selflessly toward others nearly always creates goodwill with the recipients and those observing the intersection. Oftentimes, after serving people in the community, the expressions of gratitude are awesome. In the Bible, when Jesus helped or healed a person, the responses to this expression of goodwill, listen, people, crowds were amazed, astonished, in awe and wonder, goodwill creates the platform to share the good news with others. Some intersections for service just naturally happen. Some you have to create. There you go. Selfless serving becomes a vehicle for grace. As you think about that, we have an opportunity this morning um, we're going to be blessed with a conversation. We've got a gentleman here with us this morning. His name is Bobby John. He serves with a group called Reach India. I'm going to invite him up here to the platform. As he comes up, would you give him a warm venture welcome? Awesome. Bobby John, I'm so grateful that you are here with us today. Are you still jet lagged? No, I've recovered by God's grace, and I praise God for him for giving me this opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you. 
I'm so grateful that you are here. Tell us just, if you would, a little bit about Reach India and what you do. Um, I'm the director of Reach India, and our mission is to be the hands and feet of God. And our community um, development programs, we've got five of them. We've got a boys' home, we've got a girls' home, we've got a widow support program, then we have a, a sewing school training, and we also drill wells. And these programs help us, you know, share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and impact people. So even like drilling wells, why? Because we are in the rural areas of southern India, and uh, not many villages have good uh, have access to good drinking water. So the wells that we drill opens up doors to share the gospel. We are allowed to enter a village after we drill a well there. Yeah. We got to meet last week in my office and had an incredible conversation. And multiple times as we were chatting, I couldn't help but think about intersections. Even your personal story you shared with me, and I couldn't help but think about, you talked about an earthquake, mm -hmm. how God used yes. that to move you from a cultural Christian to a fully devoted yes. follower of Jesus. Used people in your life, like uh, PB John, John who yes. some of you who have been around for a while or know about Reach India, he was the founder of that ministry, happens to be your uncle, right? Yes. And a personal intersection, God used him in a powerful way to grab a hold of you. I also, I'm a history nerd, this I thought was fascinating. When you talked about being a cultural Christian, you talked about having, you knew about Jesus in a Hindu culture in some ways because the region where you grew up, this is so cool, Jesus' disciples, the apostles, scattered. If you read the book of Acts, you know this story. Christian tradition says that one of them, Doubting Thomas? Apostle Thomas, yes. Went to your neck of the woods. Yes, yeah. he did. And planted... You said six and a half churches. Seven and a half is what my wife told me. I looked up in the internet, it said seven. So seven churches. In well, we'll go with your wife then. She's right. Period. Sorry. End of sentence. Yeah. Seven churches. Thomas plants. Here we are 2,000 years later almost. Even that's an intersection. When you think about, you and I are sitting here today because somebody told somebody about Jesus, that person told somebody about Jesus. We can all trace our lineage back to Jesus. The Apostle Paul, Thomas, I love that. I want to talk a little bit more about intersections, and I want to talk about um, the opportunities that you saw at hand there. T tell me about... Um, intersections in your life? Okay, so in India, there is a Sanskrit saying that says, Stri Janma Papa Karma. To be born as a girl is a curse. So that breaks my heart. I'm a father to two girls, and this breaks my heart to know that being born a girl, you're treated as a second-class student, um, citizen. So because of karma. Karma, yes. This belief that if I do something good in this life, I'll get good in the next life, bad for bad. That's right. Clearly, she must have done something poor. To be born as a girl. Yeah, that breaks my heart too. And uh, these girls wouldn't be educated. They wouldn't be sent to schools. And uh, they end up being either exploited by families in cities who offer uh, the parents some money and take them away, and we don't know where they head to, either trafficked or exploited in other ways. You say trafficked, just so we're clear, yes. not to be too graphic, but human yes. trafficking. Yes. Of the sexual nature, likely. That's right. Good things and bad things can happen in the intersections. When we shirk our responsibility, somebody else is looking to jump in. Yeah, sure. keep going. 2009, we came to an intersection we knew girls in our community need to be served and ministered to. So we started this program called Save the Girl, where we come alongside the family and tell the parents, God loves you, God loves your daughters, they're not inferior, they're of much value in God's eyes, 
So we need to keep them in school, give them a good education, at least the formal first 10 years, keep them in school, and we'll help you with that. So this was an intersection that we came to. We prayed, we took a step in faith, and experienced God's grace. And we began this program where we started. These families that we talk of are extremely poor. They cannot, education is free in government schools, but then to send a child to school, you need to give her a backpack, uniforms to wear, notebooks, other school supplies, and these parents weren't able to afford them. They were daily wage earners. So Care India, Reach India provides this, um, these materials to them, and here we are. They are ready to go to yeah. school and... Dignity. You're giving dignity. Dignity, yes. And then here's an opportunity, an intersection, and God does amazing things with that. What's been the impact? I don't know if you caught that. Save the Girl is the title of this program which I, I'm a big fan of just calling the thing what it is. That's literally what they're about with that, save the girls. So what, what's happened? So uh, when we started this program in 2009, we started it with 200. And how do we uh, do our work? We have 73 pastors whom we call rural development workers who uh, minister to 169 churches. And so these you, churches- Just real quick, did you catch that? 73 three pastors. pastors serving 169 churches. This is a church planting network. Yes, our main focus is that. But as they say, what good is the gospel if you can't meet the physical need of a person? So that gives us a good uh, you know, talking point when we meet the person at his point of need and share the gospel. So in 2019, we were uh, serving 10,000 girls and we were keeping 10,000 uh, girls in school and uh, the impact of this was admissions, enrollments in schools were dropping before this program, and teachers were on the verge of losing their jobs. But this program just gave a big boost, invigorated the admission procedure, and I can tell you with one thing, looking back, if you are at an intersection and you see an opportunity, God's God is never short on his grace. Mm -hmm. There is abundance. We have experienced it. And I just want to take this opportunity, Pastor, for welcome, having us here, me and Pastor Jeff, and for the support you've given our uh, ministry right from Woodland Spring days. Yeah. It goes back three decades. So yeah. thank you so much. I praise God. Yeah. 10,000 girls. I don't know if you caught that. A ton of churches planted. Incredible work. Praise it, God. You know, this new life season we're living in right now. Your kingdom dollars, those investments are going towards some incredible things in your neck of the woods in India. Thank you so much. Thank Venture, you. could we simply say thank you? Thank you. Yeah. And I want to pray for Bobby John. Would you write where you're at? Would you join me in prayer? If you're comfortable, you might even extend your hand toward him. Let's, let's pray together. God, I thank you for an opportunity that we have to love as we're loved by you. Thank you for the incredible work that Reach India is doing. Give them courage. Give them endurance. Give them strength for the long haul. And it's in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you came in today... You probably noticed the communion elements on your seat. Would you grab those right now and pull them out? As you do that, can I just simply make this statement? Our God is a global God. It's so easy for us to get myopic and think about what's happening right here and, well, this is it. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. We're stepping into a moment right now. Well, God's kingdom is big and his table is large. His children gather around it. Bobby John has brothers and sisters in Jesus who are in this moment as well on the other side of the world. So right now, would you grab those things? Think about what these elements represent. He's going to read. Would you read the text for us? We'll center our hearts and minds on Jesus and we'll take it. First Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, 
Then the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This is an intersection. This is a moment to think about grace. God's grace for you that you get to extend as an invitation of grace to others. I'm going to pray and then I invite you to take those elements as you feel led and we're going to respond. God, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. As we think about our sin, our brokenness, our need for grace, remind us that we're supposed to be a conduit of your grace in intersections of life for those around us.